All right, Michael, it's all yours. Thank you, Rob. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Michael Israel. I am the um, head of field service evangelism at Zuper, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Steve Salmon, who is the executive vice president of enterprise and partnerships for Field Nation. Steve, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Steve, thank can you, Michael. You... It's great to be here. Oh, great. Nice to have you on board as well. So the topic of today's webinar is combating the rising costs and labor shortages in field service. In other words, how to do more with less. So let's start out with uh, just a brief introduction. So I'll start by introducing myself again. My name is Michael Israel. And uh, Rob, you can advance the slide. Uh, I, as I said, I'm the uh, head of uh, evangelism for field service at Zuper. I have about 50 years in the field service industry. I spend about my first 20 years in actual field service operations, much of that with IBM Field Engineering, where I managed uh, parts distribution center. I also managed uh, field, field technician forces, both in the United States and uh, internationally. So with that brief introduction, let me turn it over to Steve. And Steve, would you give us a little background about yourself, please? Yeah, absolutely, Michael. Thank you. So uh, good morning, good afternoon. I am uh, Steve Salmon. I lead the enterprise uh, strategy and execution along with the partnerships at uh, Field Nation. I've been in the IT services and software business for about 30 years now, uh, kind of across the spectrum of you know, very large uh, services companies uh, and then some startups as well. Um, and uh, excited to hear to talk about this topic today. So you've been in the business for about 30 years, you said? That's correct. So in other words, you're a young man still. <laughs> I like to think of myself that way. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is the agenda. Steve and I will uh, share talking about this agenda, but this is the agenda of items we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about some of the major challenges in field service today. And we have a study that I'll reference uh, as part of that discussion. We're going to talk also about the impact of uh, digitization and technology on field service. And Steve, let me ask you to talk, uh, just briefly talk about the next topic, uh, changing field worker landscape. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the challenges that have uh, evolved in the last, uh, you know, five years, last couple of years, especially with the pandemic, and then mm -hmm. some of the new options that are available to uh, companies today. Yeah, that's great. And in keeping with the whole theme of the uh, uh, the webinar today, we're also going to talk about how service leaders can and are doing more with less. And we're also going to have talk about the impact of uh, technology and the impact of financial dilemmas and financial gains, et cetera, on the customer experience and on customer loyalty. So uh, those will be the main topics that we'll cover throughout the rest of this webinar. And I think coming up next, Rob, I think we have a poll, do we not? Yes. So Rob is opening up a poll, and the question is, what are the top three biggest challenges in your organization? And it's a multiple choice question. As you can see, pick as many as you want or as, as many as are appropriate. And we'll leave this open for about 30 to 45 seconds, and then Rob will be able to report on the results a bit later. So I think that's good. Uh, thank you, everyone, for those participating. And as soon as we have the results, Rob, you can just uh, interrupt and share the results with all of us. So we can move on then. Uh, let me hide that poll. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we uh, did have a study done uh, very recently by uh, Michael Blumberg of Blumberg Advisory Services. And uh, Blumberg Advisory Services uh, specializes in research and consulting and advisory in the field service ecosystem. And within the last couple of months, we, Zuper, engaged Michael to do a study on the state of the field service uh, industry. And he came up with some very, very interesting results. So these this graph represents what uh, the survey respondents answered when asked, what are the top three biggest challenges to growth facing your service business today? And as you can see, the top one was inflation and recession, or at least the fear of inflation and or inflation and the fear of recession. 
that may have abated just a bit over the last couple of months. I would suspect that if we were to ask the same question again today, we might get a bit of a different answer. But when this was question was asked a, a couple of months ago, that was the top concern. And then the next uh, concern was the pressure on pricing. And uh, let me stop for a minute. Rob, I see we have some results. So the top three biggest challenges as answered by our webinar attendees, pricing pressure, shrinking labor pool. Boy, that plays right into uh, what we're going to talk about, right, Steve? Yeah. And next competition was the next biggest one. And as we can see here, as I was saying, the fear of uh, inflation and recession seems to have abated somewhat. So, Rob, thank you very much for sharing those. So just continuing down this uh, graph that uh, Mr. Blumberg of Blumberg Advisory had put together, uh, we can see inflation recession was high back then. Pressures on pricing is very consistent with what our webinar attendees answered, as is shrinking labor pool. Very, very top concerns. So, um, Steve, I want to ask you, what in, in your experience in dealing with the customers that Field Nation has and the prospects that you deal with, what are the biggest issues facing service leaders that you hear? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I'd say that, um, you know, in, in 2023, the theme seems to center around, you know, delivering quality outcomes cost effectively. You know, obviously, that's not a surprise. That's not that's not new. Um, but I, I don't think the dynamics have ever been as pronounced as they are today. You know, if you think about it, um, during the pandemic and kind of post-pandemic, uh, the digital transformation initiatives that took off really drove significant increases in demand around installs and, and projects and rollouts. You then couple that with uh, some never seen before economic conditions, right? I mean, the labor shortage, uh, supply chain disruptions, um, I mean, it, I mean, it's harder to find talent now than, than it's ever been, right? Yeah. And yeah. then those supply chain disruptions just increased the normal project volatility that you would get with projects. You know, you never know where the next, if you're a service organization, you never know where the next project location is going to be. You know, am, am I installing this footprint or that footprint? And then you throw the supply chain disruption on top of that to increase the volatility. And so, you know, you know Michael, in my, in my opinion, it's really never been more difficult to be a service leader than it is right now today. And, and you know, I think the net of it is the leaders are, are being asked to, to do more, to do it better, and, and to do it with less at a rate that we've never seen before. Yeah, that, that's very, very interesting. And uh, I think that um, Field Nation actually can provide help in that regard, right, with, with the uh, on-demand workforce capabilities that Field Nation offers to customers. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, it, it it gives uh, companies the ability to access workers in a way they've never been able to access them before, right. um, and in a way with increased visibility, um, uh, and uh, you know, ideally access those workers as close to the job site as possible. Yeah, and I I also think that um, pan the pandemic changed things. Right, there were. A lot of people, we've all, all heard about the great resignation. Uh, I, I also think about it as the great reassignment, so to speak. So there were a lot of people that decided, gee, I don't want to be in this 40-hour-a-week job anymore. I don't want to be sitting at my desk and doing the same thing over and over again. So I think you've been kind of blessed, really. Field Nation has been kind of blessed in a way by having those workers that would like to have a little flexibility in their life uh, that might not feel like they have to answer to one person or to one company constantly all the time. You've reaped some benefits from that. Is that not correct? Absolutely. It certainly increased the, the size of the on-demand workforce. You know, one of the one of the unique things that happened during the pandemic, you know, pre-pandemic, most of the workers fit the profile that you just described. You know, they're looking for additional flexibility, tended to be younger workers. Mm -hmm. but, you know, during the pandemic and post-pandemic, it's really a much it's broadened out quite a bit across really all the generations of workers. You know, in fact, we see a lot of workers that are later in their working years now choosing this in, in early retirement or pre-retirement um, or in lieu of retirement. Quite quite honestly, so yeah, quite seasoned workers. So the the amount of workers in the in the in the we see in the on-demand workforce uh, is is quite broad now. Yeah, it's very interesting. In the you know the people that I talk to, both in industry and and personally, there seems to be less and less interest in actually retiring full time. 
people, people want to stay busy doing something. So to your point about some of the senior workers in the field service space wanting to continue to work, even if it's on a part-time basis and have the flexibility to determine their hours and determine the, uh, what they want to do, that's a very, very good thing for the industry, for the people, and for your company and for the customers, actually. Everybody everybody wins in that scenario, quite honestly. Yeah, yep, exactly, correct. Uh, so Rob, would you advance to the next slide, please? Again, in this uh, in the study that we had done by the Blumberg Advisory gr uh, Group, we asked, what factor has the most significant impact on rising operating costs? And this will kind of come as no surprise. Uh, and Steve, I'll let you chime in on this as well. Labor is uh, the most important or the most significant, and the cost of parts is secondary only to labor. That's pretty consistent with all the studies that I've ever been involved in in field service. What are your thoughts, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we you know we see parts and labor as the two largest individual components of delivering field services, and I think that's been that way for quite some time. I, and yeah. I don't expect that to change quite honestly anytime soon. I mean, those are the two things that are just hard to uh, automate with this technology. And I think right. we'll see that. You know, my, Michael, I, you know, I've got a question for you. You know, I know I know you also speak to a lot of service leaders in this space. Um, you know, when, when you talk to them, how how are they navigating this do more, um, do it better and do it with less scenario? Well, I think uh, there's a there's a few answers. The number one answer in, in my mind and in the conversations that we have with people is to leverage technology and to make sure that you're in, implementing technology such as Zuper, such as uh, Field Nation, technology capabilities that will enable them to en enable the service provider to become more productive to deliver service at a, at a reduced cost, to make sure that they're maximizing the revenue that is generated from, from the service. So the implement, in, implementation of technology and all of the capabilities that it, it can bring to an organization is forefront in people's minds, I think. Uh, just to address the question of a shortage of labor, for example, um, technology can help companies understand and analyze where the labor is being used efficiently versus where the labor is not being used efficiently and is being used, in fact, very inefficiently. And when they can identify that those facts and identify those trends, then they can identify also the steps that they need to take in order to make sure that those inefficient service deliveries are uh, served in a way that makes them more efficient. And one of those ways might be to engage uh, your organization, Field Nation. For example, if you have a customer in Casper, Wyoming, and you do not have a technician in Casper, Wyoming, no offense to Casper or Wyoming, um, and you have to send a technician from Denver up to Casper to take care of a problem whenever it occurs, then it would make a lot of sense for that organization that has the customer in Casper, Wyoming, to look at the possibility of using uh augmented labor, contract labor, so to speak, somebody available that has the skills and training in the Wyoming area to respond to those calls when needed, rather than having to transport somebody from Denver to Casper and back every time there's a problem. So perhaps a, a, an oversimplified example, but it, it is an example of the kinds of steps that organizations can take in order to not only reduce their cost of service delivery, but also improve the delivery to the customer itself. And yep. I know Zuper, you you guys help uh, customers automate a lot of those processes. Are you yeah, seeing a big part of that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the great things about Zuper is that it's so flexible. Um, customers can configure the system. We can easily customize the system. But more importantly, they can define their own workflows, their own notification patterns and, and timing uh, without having to do any coding. So they can, uh, the customers, the end users of Zuper can define a workflow that enforces a particular a process in delivering service or in creating an invoice or in creating a, a quote or in uh, reporting labor hours or parts usage. And in so defining those specific workflows, they're able to make the software manage their business 
or co- conform to their business requirements rather than have the business conform to the software. So yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for asking. Okay, uh, Rob, next slide, please. Steve, this is in your bailiwick, I think, uh, as much as mine, if not more, the changing field worker landscape. Can you address this, please? Yeah, I think, um, you know, what we see is, you know, as as the worker landscape has changed, uh, companies are, are more challenged now than ever at getting, you know, the right tech at the right place at the right time. And of, co- of course, you know, um, coupling that with the right part at the right place at the right time, uh, which often, you know, makes even that more complicated and, and do it in a way that is, you know, you can provide a quality experience for your end, your end customer, whoever that might be. Uh, and then and ultimately have visibility kind of real time. And we, we see these are kind of the, the really tough the, the big rocks, if you will, in, in, in tackling this problem. They've gotten even tougher in the last couple of years. There's a question that came in that's directed specifically at you, Steve. It says, uh, uh, Steve, how are you managing technicians while walking the fine line between 1099s and W-2s? Uh, you know, that is a great question. Um, you know, it's uh, it the... Um, the, I think the nuance is uh, for 1099s, it's important that the buyer does not, the company that's engaged in the 1099, you know, doesn't want to tell that worker how to do their work, but more right. but instead what work needs to be done. So uh, you might say, well, we want you to install A, test A, install B, you know, test the two together, but not how to actually turn the screwdriver. And there's an important distinction there. Um, but, but that is really important so that you're able to uh, engage the 1099s in a way that's compliant uh, with the labor laws. Yeah, I think you you said something that I thought was very interesting, and I'm not sure I get the ed- words exactly correct here, but you said something to the effect that the 1099 workers don't want to be told what to do or how to do it. Um, they just... Yeah, it's it's they want to be told what to do. Like you need to install. You know, yeah, what, sorry. Yeah, the work, the work what the work is to be done. But it's the how that, that's where the nuance is. And, and it's not just that they don't want to be told. A lot of them don't need to be told. Most of them don't, in fact. Um, but in, you know, that's one of the important distinctions a lot of the states look at when you're trying to decide, you know, is this worker really eligible to be a 1099 or, or not? You know, or is it or is this work the right work for a 1099 worker versus a W-2 worker? Which I, I'm guessing that's the the, the question was a, along those lines. Yeah, correct. So uh, one of the things that I'd be interested in hearing, and perhaps our audience would be as well, is in managing the uh, on-demand workforce that you have, how do you make sure that when a technician uh, that's part of your ecosystem is dispatched to work on a problem at a customer, how do you make sure that that technician has the right skills, the right experience in order to do that work effectively? Um, so, so our, our, our platform, uh, has a number of, uh, capabilities built into it, algorithms that helps our, um, custom, our buyers, um, make sure that, you know, based on the requirements of the work that they're able to align that with the worker. So based on past work history. So, you know, many of the workers on our platform have thousands and thousands of jobs they've completed on the platform. And so we're able to not only use their profile and what they, what experience that they say they have but we can couple that with the work that they've actually completed successfully and that customers have rated that work and said this work was done great and met our expectations. So we're able to use those work patterns and those work history patterns to ensure that the workers have the right skills and tools to complete the job. Yeah, that's great. And it brings me back back a little bit to a point we were talking about earlier, and that is the importance of technology, the importance of technology in helping to make sure that your service operations are as efficient as possible. So you're able, the the technology is what enables the gathering and the storing and the analysis of the data, right? And it's that data then that allows you to make sure that you are identifying and assigning the right people with the right skills to the right place. Without that data, you wouldn't be able to know. You wouldn't be able to do it as accurately as you're as you're able to do it now. That's correct. We've got we've got a couple of uh, really smart matching algorithms that allow us to do that match. You know, ultimately at the end of the day, 
each one of our customers has the ability to override the match and pick pick a worker of choice. You know, based on, that may be a worker they've worked with on their own or a worker sure. they've vetted. But the matching algorithms are based on, you know, kind of large data models that allow us to, to do those matches. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Rob, would you advance to the next slide, please? Thank you very much. And once again, we have some data here that was gathered through the study that uh, Mr. Blumberg of Blumberg Advisory Services did. The question is, uh, how much do you agree with each of these statements? And I won't try to read each of the statements to you in, in uh, depth, but I'd, I think we'd like to focus on at least the top two. And the first one is, our customers expect a proactive service experience from our company. And the second one, closely behind, is our customers expect their service issues to be resolved correctly on the first visit. So those things, in my opinion, really, really go hand in hand. If you've got a consistent experience where a technician comes out, fixes something, but, oh, gee, it's not fixed, and either he or she has to come back again or another technician has to be sent back, that certainly impacts your customer's perspective of the experience that they're re they've received through the service provided. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, customer experience is at the kind of forefront of, of everything. I can, is every conversation these days starts with customer experience. Um, yeah. And, you know, historically, the, you know, that was talked about in terms of, you know, how you know, can we get everything resolved in the first visit? It's obviously a lot more complicated than that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That, that is the, the key thing. You know, I, I, you know, Michael, I, in, in talking to service leaders, you know, I, I hear this all the time and I'd be, I'd, I think maybe for our listeners, it'd be great to hear your perspective on, you know, what, what do you think one action is that they could take away like today to, to deliver a higher level of service, to give that customer experience, you know, maybe with fewer resources or even allowing them, even doing it in a way that allows them to moderate that cost. Well, I don't think there is any one action. I, I think it's a combination of actions and a combination of not only actions, but a combination of philosophies and attitudes as well. So I hate to belabor the technology point, but I will. Uh, it's extraordinarily important that companies implement technologies that are going to help them make sure that the service that they deliver is delivered on time is delivered correctly by the people that have the right skills and is delivered within the confines or the constraints, excuse me, of the service level agreements or contracts they have with the customers. And gathering data about the service that is delivered will help organizations identify not only when that happens. So when it happens, what did I do right to make it happen? But also when it doesn't happen, what did we or I do wrong so that it did not happen? And if you don't have the data about how much time was spent on the correcting the diagnosing and correcting the problem, who was the engineer that was sent to work on the problem? What are the confines or the constraints of the uh, service level agreement or the contract we have with the customer that we either met or didn't meet? If you don't have that data, to identify the trends, whether they be positive or negative, then you cannot take action to correct the trends. Now, let me let me just expand on that a minute. It's really important to identify trends that are negative, of course. If all of a sudden you see that um, work on a particular model number is taking longer than it normally does, or it's taking longer in Portland, Oregon than it is in Dallas, Texas, for example. If you identify that trend, then you can you can analyze why that's happening and you can take corrective action. On the other hand, if Portland is exceeding performance versus Dallas, so another you know same coin, different side, what is it that Portland is doing right that Dallas isn't? So. I think having the data available to analyze the trends that may exist in service delivery is incredibly important in identifying the steps that you need to take to either take advantage of a positive trend or take corrective action versus a negative trend. So I think that's one thing. Technology and data are one thing. And I, I, I use them as one thing because they really go hand in hand. 
The other thing is philosophy. The organization has to have from the top down enforced constantly a customer centric philosophy or what we refer to at Zuper as a completed service work philosophy. Completed service work means when I'm done doing my work, when I'm done doing the task that I was assigned, what else can I do for the customer? What other question can I answer? What other information can I give to them? What other recommendations can I give to them over and beyond what I was assigned to do? So it's a combination of leveraging technology and having the right attitude or the right philosophy, or to put it even in a more deep way, the right DNA in your organization. Rob, would you advance the next slide, please? And before we go into this, um, we have another question for Steve. You're a popular man today, Steve. Uh, Steve, how are you managing technicians while walking that? Well, that's the one we answered already. Yeah, we answered that, walking the fine line of 1099 versus W2. It looks like we got the same question in from two different people. So we'll move on. So uh, I think this has a lot to do with the data and the technology that we've talked about already. Rethinking your measurement and components of, of work for a successful outcome. Any thoughts and advice that you have for customers on that topic, Steve? You know, I, I could go on on this topic for hours, but uh, I know we're, we're, we're kind of time here. So we're a little, also, we're a little limited short I'll of focus that. Focus on one area. <laughs> you know, I, I see, uh, I see um, oftentimes the, the metrics, the, the key performance metrics tend to change slowly in field services. And one that's, that's kind of long in the tooth is utilization, for example. You know, I think, I think organizations need to rethink utilization as their key measure for, for efficiency and effectiveness and focus rather on profitability or revenue per tech per day. See, utilization just doesn't give you what you need to optimize for both quality and profitability. It only, it only optimizes for cost. And so, so for example, consider like, um, I, I, would, I would recommend it to, to service, leader, service leaders to consider sending you know, predictable, complex, high value, worker, high value work to their employees and then outsourcing kind of on-demand work or routine work or smart hand work uh, where is where possible. And you know, I think you know, when we talk to W2s, we constantly hear that you know W2s want to be challenged. They want to um, they want to have less windshield time, but they want to be busy, right? And all yeah. too often, W2s get saddled with uh, low-level work that is miles away simply to drive up the utilization and to drive what what appears to be this kind of north star metric around, you know, is our organization efficient, but it doesn't address quality. And it certainly, we've seen it have pretty significant impacts on attrition, you know? And so instead what we recommend is, you know, or what I recommend is, you know, is to optimize, optimize your direct labor around revenue and profitability per day, and then use variable labor methods uh, to get for all the rest of the work, you know, to get, to get Texas as close to the job as possible. And, and it, you know, what I believe is, I believe that's a win kind of all the way around. I think that Organizations will retain their top talent that way. They'll make their clients happier because they won't be waiting for the technician that's the employee to drive further just to get the utilization up. They'll get the, the worker that's closer to the job site so they'll get service quicker so that then clients happier. And all that will happen while reducing costs. So I, th I think shifting away from this utilization centric focus is really important. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, uh, one of my favorite sayings comes from a consultant that we work with often, a fellow by the name of David Knorr of the Knorr Group. And one of his say sayings that I really like is, never confuse output with outcome. And when you talk about productivity and measuring productivity and utilization, uh, specifically utilization, if that's all you're measuring, you're measuring output, not outcome. Because you may have very, very high utilization rates but the customer satisfaction level may be very low. And if you have if you have low customer satisfaction level, then that portends badly for customer churn, for loss in revenue, for uh, lack of positive recommendations to potential other customers. It, it, it will generate competitive loss, et cetera. So it's really important not to just measure the output, but what is the outcome? So if you, and this may be as a, an extreme example, if you do 10 jobs a day and you have customers that just have a six or a seven or a five on average on the, on the net promoter score, 
versus doing six jobs a day and all your customers are eight, nines, and tens, which is better? Yeah, I, I would argue that the six or seven customers with eight, nines, and tens are better in the long run. <laughs> it may not look as good from a utilization standpoint in the short term, but what are the long-term benefits that you're going to gain? You're going to gain customer loyalty, which means the customer is going to stick with you. If they stick with you, they're going to spend more money. They're going to refer. They're going to be a positive reference. And you're not going to experience the same churn that you would experience if you had a handful of customers or many customers with a five a five or six, for example, uh, on the net promoter score. So let me check, Rob. It, we may have another customer, another question coming in. Uh, yes, we do. It's also for Steve. Steve. You're a popular man, as I said. Uh, how can you manage the constant on-site delays technicians incur every day? Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm best to answer that one or you. I, I think Zuper has some really interesting technology to help to help optimize some of that. You know, unfortunately, that's just the nature of field services, right? I mean, inevitably, um, things happen. You know, traffic, <laughs> auto accidents. Sometimes jobs take longer than they're expected. Um, and you know, the last thing you want to do is have a technician leave the current job site half finished just to get to the next job site on time, you know? And, and so at the end of the day, you could, you know, you know, that would have, you'd have two upset customers then as opposed to just one upset customer because it was delayed. But I know, you know, um, having, you know, having backup technicians and having, you know, enough capacity in the, in the work pool to be able to absorb that is important. Again, another reason why sometimes utilization might encourage you to, to make the wrong decision there. You might be overutilized and not have the capacity to, to make those kinds of last minute adjustments. But I know, I know Michael, you know, your guys' software helps address some of these rescheduling and, opt, you know, route optimization kind of challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Zuper has the ability to uh, allow the uh, dispatchers or the managers to make decisions themselves about who they want to assign to what, what uh, <clears throat> excuse me, work order. That can be uh, that can be automated uh, so that the system can make recommendations to the manager or the dispatcher, or it can be fully audit, automated where the system actually d d develops the routes that the technicians are going to take and prioritizes the routes based upon the priority of the events, the the distance between and the travel time between uh, accounts. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we can take some of that decision-making completely out of the hands of the human, so to speak, uh, and automate the full process while at the same time not removing the human entirely so that the human element can always override the system and say, you know, I know that this is a higher priority than the system may have gleaned. So I'm going to move this job to the top of the list um, uh, rather than the one that's currently at the top of the list that the system may have developed. So it's a, it's the best of both worlds. We can use artificial intelligence algorithms to develop the schedule and the route but we also allow the human being that's involved to exercise human judgment to make the route and the schedule a little bit better as well. So I see we have another slide up from the study. Uh, what technology solutions have you implemented in the past to improve operating efficiency and increase profitability? Um, the top one is enabling service employees and field technicians with customer and job details in real time for improved employee productivity, accuracy, and service delivery. Um, so this is very important, obviously, because it impacts customer satisfaction. It impacts the uh, timeliness with which you can get work done. It impacts the accuracy with which work can get done. So once again, we're talking about technology that enables the capture and storage of data and the presentation of that data to the appropriate people, which is the service technician, maybe the dispatcher and the managers, so that they can make the most appropriate decision given the facts at hand as represented by the data. So um, again, it's a technology play that uh, is very, very important in achieving the kinds of results that customers and the survey respondents here want to achieve. The next important and is also the next two were equal scheduling and dispatch and route optimization, which we've talked about and streamlining and automating workflows around work order management. 
As I mentioned earlier, Zuper includes some very, very robust capabilities that allow the Zuper users to define with without coding the workflows that are very appropriate and most uh, most significant for their business process. Steve, any additional thoughts on this? You know, the the real time point is always interesting to me. I mean, I think the ability to have data available that's accurate and up to date to the moment um, in, improves the decision making ability for organizations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and when we're talking about sometimes you know service levels that are four hour, eight hour kind of service levels, to meet those, you know, every moment you lose just impacts your ability. You know, so I'm always curious, you know, how how do you guys think about that real time aspect at Super? Well, uh, you know, we're providing the technician that's in the field on his or her mobile device with all the information that they need in order to effectively diagnose and uh, resolve a problem. That information is constantly updated in real time by the information, uh, using the information and the data that's available that we store in Zupas, Zuper. So, for example, if we know a customer has had a problem yesterday with a particular piece of equipment and there was a technician there yesterday to work on it, and today the customer calls back, the technician that goes out today, whether it's the same technician or a new technician, has immediate access to all the information that was gathered yesterday. If the call, if a customer calls in um, five minutes after placing a request for a service and updates the priority of that service to urgent versus just medium, the technician in the field knows immediately via the notifications that Zuper provides that the tech that the customer has now changed the priority of the order. And therefore, the technician and the dispatcher, for that matter, can react in response to the customer's change in the priority of that order. Um, so those are a couple of simple examples of the kinds of data that's available that's current and real time that it can impact the ability of the service provider to deliver service in a timely and correct manner. Makes sense? Absolutely. That's great. So... I think, Rob, can you move on to the next slide? What, but before you do, I want to make one other point here. See if you could back it up, Rob. Sorry, my, my error. Um, one of the things that we also do in Zuper in order to empower the technicians on site to be as effective as possible in resolving a problem and diagnosing a problem is we allow the customers, the users of the Zuper system, to create custom checklists and inspection checklists. So you can set up a checklist for a specific type of asset, for example, a specific type of installed equipment that will tell the technician the exact steps to go through in order to diagnose a particular kind of problem. Having that kind of information available to the technician in real time, meaning that the technician doesn't need to go find a manual online somewhere or make a phone call to someone else to ask them what's the best way to identify the cause of this problem, those checklists can be easily defined, again, without coding by the appropriate people in the service organization. So the tech, technician that's on site using a mobile device, uh, uh, an iPhone or a tablet or whatever, can have access to that tablet and can get that access to that checklist and can follow the checklist in order to accurately diagnose and repair a problem. Uh, again, a simple example, but it's the kind of information that uh, users can define in Zuper that is available immediately to the technician on site and even before they go on site so they can see whether or not they need to take any parts or materials or particular kind of tools, for example. So having said that, Rob, you could then now go back to the other slide. So some key takeaways. Uh, Steve, I'm going to ask you to talk about this first and then I'll chime in. What do you think about the key takeaways that... Uh, uh, listeners to this webcast should be thinking about as they go forward to help them improve their service operations? Yeah, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, um, if if we got to balance customer experience, so other quality, in other words, and cost, you know, we really need to rethink um, the individual components, um, but especially the, the diversification of the workforce in terms of uh, and when it makes most of 
most tends to use the direct workers versus subcontractors versus independent workers. Uh, and, and then really allowing the type of work to drive that as opposed to an arbitrary efficiency or productivity uh, target. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to beat a dead horse again, but uh, again, increasing automation, making sure that you're taking advantage of all the automation and technologies that are available today to help you improve your and improve and maintain the improved service operations. One of the slides that we looked at earlier, I don't remember which one exactly, showed that um, the respondents to the survey felt that the cost of investing in technology to improve their field service operations was negligible, minimal when compared to other costs in delivering service. So cost of implementing technology should not be a major factor in deciding which technologies you want to implement because the the benefits provided by technologies and automation far outweigh the downside of the cost that you have to invest in order to do it. So I think that's an important point. Uh, one of the th one of the things that the study also showed, we didn't have a slide on it in this presentation, but one of the things it also showed is that while a large majority of the companies that were surveyed say that they do have field service management software in place, less than half of them were taking advantage of all the capabilities within field service management. The major focus was on work order management, but they were not taking advantage of things like quotations and invoicing and um, using checklists to help uh, tech guide technicians through a diagnosis and a repair process. So even though companies may be using some technology to manage and improve field service operations, they're not using all of the capabilities that are available through those technology solutions. So that's one thing that I would suggest that people look at. Even if you have technology to, uh, technology implemented today, make sure that you have all the technology implemented that can help you improve and sustain those improved operations. Steve, back to you. Thoughts? Yeah, no, I think that's right. You know, the only thing I would kind of, the last point that I would make is, you know, we talk about uh, artificial intelligence here as a key takeaway. We didn't get a chance to talk about that a lot today. Right. You know, what I'd say is that it seems kind of daunting. Like, how do I get into that? But I'd say that first and foremost, most service organizations have an immense amount of data. So yep. they have a lot of data to start building the decision-making models. And then to partner with organizations like Zupa or Orfield Nation to help them leverage that to, to make better decisions uh, and ultimately obviously automate, but make better decisions is a great starting place. Yeah, very good. And then one of the ways to explore ways to do more with less is, of course, is to leverage Field Nation and their on-demand workforce to help you deliver service on time and accurately. And then the last uh, key takeaway that I would like to emphasize is, I believe I referred to it briefly earlier, the concept of completed service work. Make sure that your organization from the top down is very, very focused on customer satisfaction, customer experience and customer loyalty. If you have the best scheduling system in the world that gets all the technicians where they need to be on time, at the right place, if they do a lousy job of doing service or if they have a lot if they do a if they're not good at interacting with the customer, if they don't leave the customer feeling good, even if the machine was repaired, so to speak, the customers remember how not only the work they did, but they remember how the technician left them feeling. So that's really important to make sure that you have the right uh, customer centric mentality and philosophy spread throughout your organization. Steve, any other final thoughts? I think that covered it. That was, uh, that was good. Yeah. So I think uh, this has been very good. We've had a few dozen, uh, more than a few dozen participants actually in the uh, pod in the webcast today. So thank you everyone for participating and the vast majority of them, Steve and everyone have stayed on to the very end. So we're very grateful for that. Hopefully uh, you learn some things that will be helpful in running your business. And we look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you very much. Rob, I think we're done.